Um, this is not a popcorn popper. This is a George Foreman grill. Literally a George Foreman grill. George Foreman used to be a boxer. Okay, I don't know if he, he boxed Muhammad Ali, but then somehow he figured something out. And he saw, by the way, does anybody know trivia? He's got five sons and seven daughters. Does everybody know all of George Foreman's sons' names? George. He named every one of his kids George. Every one of his boys George. It's not, boy George, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's like George Jr., George II, George III, and they all have nicknames. So if you're wondering how does he get a hold of all, all of them, but that's, that's how I play. But that's a George Foreman grill. And so I send out on social media yesterday a question, and I got so many responses that I thought I'd read some of them to you. I thought some of them were quite entertaining. Um, the question was this. What is the most important key to a great barbecue? And answers like the company. Hunger. Thank you, Kenan. Hunger. Um, I was going to say the people who come to eat with you. Um, the, a guy that works at McDonald's, he sees me all the time. He goes, uh, inviting me. Hope it's great. Uh, the sauce, fire, something to cook it on. Uh, smoke and sauce. I like KC Masterpiece. Meat. Uh, someone tending the grill or fire if you're smoking. I'm a good grill tent person. <laughs> Inviting the Eating. Um, everything but the sauce. One guy thro- threw this and he said, God. <laughs> and I just wrote underneath it, you're so spiritual. You know? um, preparation. Being there. The grill, it's a sushi bar otherwise. <laughs> um, the meat, an invitation to it, fire and meat. I, this is pr- priceless. Enough beer for cooking, eating, and the campfire afterwards. <laughs> uh, time, if you're talking about barbecue, if you're talking about grilling, which people confuse all the time, it is heat. Barbecue low and slow, grill hot and fast. And then Yolanda, thank you. Rich says food, and I say friends. So that's good. Um, Simple seasoning, don't hide the meat. Charcoal, real wood. Patience, don't mess with it. Let it cook. One of my friends, a plump kitty. He's sick. This person's sick. The friends you share it with, uh, having friends to be with. Well, I was thinking about that. It's definitely the meat for me. This scene from this, this video is not from a barbecue. It's actually from a restaurant, but this guy says my heart. So I want you to appreciate what he says. And I hope you please listen carefully because it's important you hear what he says. This isn't a steak. Why would you call it that on your menu? I don't know what to tell you, man. Just give me all the bacon and eggs you have. Wait, wait. I worry what you just heard was, give me a lot of bacon and eggs. What I said was, give me all the bacon and eggs you have. Do you understand? I want you to show it one more time. Thank you. This isn't a steak. Why would you call it that on your menu? I don't know what to tell you, man. Just give me all the bacon and eggs you have. Wait, wait. I worry what you just heard was, give me a lot of bacon and eggs. (laughs) What I said was, give me all the bacon and eggs you have. Do you understand? I'm telling you, that is poetry. <laughs> Meat. Just, aren't, am I, amen, men? <laughs> you'll, sometimes you'll show up and it's like, really? That's, boom, give it to me. I, I was, um, I texted my son who likes to barbecue, and he, um, I texted him because I want to know the difference between, um, well, I've got a marinade here and a rub here. 
And I said, what's the difference between a marinade and a rub? This is, this is my son's answer from Texas. He loves to barbecue. He says, just how it sounds. I go, okay, that helps. He goes, no, a marinade penetrates into the meat and usually has vinegar in it. It helps break down the meat fibers, and a rub, rub adds flavor to the bark. Yes. Um, and I said, thanks. When I, when I think about, yeah, when I, when I think about what is involved with a good barbecue, you'll watch people, and it's almost like a worship experience. We're going to be talking about altar and worship and, and things along that line. And so I wanted to kind of correlate that with um, what Moses is setting up in Exodus 20. This is immediately following the Ten Commandments. He starts talking immediately about an altar. And so, wow, it's so important to God that after he sets up the Big Ten, he talks about sacrifice. And so let's pray and then look at the word uh, together concerning this. Father, I ask you this morning that as we're looking into your word, the things that you want us to have an understanding of, we understand this is the law given to the, given to the people of Israel. But Father, you said it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And so we know we live in the age of grace. We know that we are in this church age, that we aren't Israel, but we've been given principles through that, and ultimately it's pointing to the cross. And so, Father, would you help us this morning as we look at this together? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you please open your Bible to... Um, Exodus chapter uh, 20. We're coming to the end of this chapter, and I want you to notice just before we get to the verses that we're going to be working through together, we come to verse 18, and he says this. He says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid, and they trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. And so I, we're fine if you be our representative and then whatever he tells you, we'll hear it from you. We don't want to hear it directly from God. We have it. They actually, it seems like they have an opportunity to draw close to God, but they're terrified of it. And I think sometimes that could be us. I'm I don't want to get close to God. I'll let other people do it. I'll have other people that, that seem to, you know, I'll, I'll have them pray for me. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But God wants us to draw near to him through the, through the works of Christ. I can come boldly to the throne of grace because of what Christ did. I don't have to keep having this priest do it for me. I don't have to have this rep. I can do it because I am in Christ. So you, need, you and I need to understand that. It's, it's not, you, I'll let these other people, these holier people than me, we're all called to holiness. We're all called to relationship with him. He says, verse 20, Moses said to the people, do not fear. So he, he knows what God's like. He goes, if you know him, of course, I, I respect, but I, I've gotten to know him and it's dear. It's special. Do not fear. For God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. So he, of course he wants to, you and I to take him seriously. Of course he wants us to not want, have a desire uh, to be living in sin and holding on to sin. But it's, it's like there, you see verse 21. The people stood afar off while Moses draw near to the thick darkness where God was. And I, I believe that God for all of us as Christians is saying, draw near to me. Draw near to me. Some of, you, some of us believe lies about God. That's what keeps us away from him. That he doesn't really have the best for us. That, that what his thoughts toward us are destructive. I mean, think about that for you as a father, you as a mother, you as a friend. Do you want to have that kind of relationship with someone that you love? Well, obviously, you'd love for them to respect your word. You'd love for them to think so much of your relationship that, that they're not going to lie, they're not going to manipulate, they're not going to hide stuff. But you don't want them to live in this, this, 
this horror of you, this terror of you. And that's where they're at. I mean, think of all the stuff that he's done for them, how he's, he's initiated relationship, how he's cared for them through food and, and through moving and the closeness of the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and, and, and just constantly caring for them. Well, we come to this section, if you want to take um, your, out of the bulletin, there's a section you can fill some blanks and, and work through this together. Point number one is this, God speaks. God speaks. Look at verse 22. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. This is huge. God's word comes out of heaven. We, sometimes you and I, we know it. We'd love to have this every now and then. What, what do you want me to do? I want you to do. Finally. Whatever that is, I'd love, I'd love to hear it. Maybe we wouldn't want to hear it. But God's word comes out of heaven. We can't take this like, lightly. Uh, that would be an abomination to take that lightly. And so we need to listen and apply. So God speaks. Look at verse 23. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. That's, that's the number one, first of the ten. Uh, it seems simple enough. It's the first. They had already said, we got this. Remember they had said this? Everything you say we, we can do, you, we got this. The truth of the matter is this. They didn't got this. They are going to soon disobey. And so God speaks. Point number two, we sacrifice. We sacrifice. The, the altar would be a place where God's name would be honored. And Israel could sacrifice to come near to the Lord. Um, in the law of God, an altar was constructed where the people of God could shed the blood of an animal because no one would be good enough for God by their works. There's a reason why Leviticus follows Exodus. I'm giving you law, but I know you can't do it. I mean, if we could do it, if I, Israel says, I got this, then even if he started to talk about constructing an altar, they could go, well, we don't need this. I don't need a sacrifice. I got this. I'm going to obey. I'm going to do everything right. But because he knows what they're like, he's going to talk about altar and what that looks like. Remember they had said they'd obey everything? And why do they need to build an altar? J. Vernon McGee, this old preacher, if you, he's still on the radio sometimes. I love his accent. He said this, The altar speaks of the cross of Christ and the blood that he shed. We will never have a relation with, re relationship with God based on our works or our attempts to keep the Old Testament law. There is only one way, and that is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is his blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So what does God ask them concerning building an altar? Well, look at the first part of verse 24. Talking about building an altar. An altar of earth you shall make for me. Okay, just, just first of all, just to, if you're writing notes, you can write this in, down. It had to be made of dirt. Now, there's a reason why he's doing what he's doing. It had to be made of of dirt. See, altars and shrines made to false deities were elaborate, rich minerals, carefully built and constructed, and God didn't want silver and gold. He wanted some dirt and some rocks, and they would do just fine for the worship of God. Do you see what he's, what he's trying to teach? What are we made of? I mean, if I'm going back to the creation story, God formed out of the dust of the ground, man. And so I want you to remember what you're made of, and so I want you to take dirt, and I want you to use that to put this together. Oh, but I want to I make something nice for him. And you'll see later when they're building the tabernacle or they're building the temple, he's, he, he's saying, well, I can accept that. But do you see the danger in that? There's a thing called the Crystal Cathedral. You ever hear of it out in California? Um, you ever watch? I used to watch. My dad loved watching Robert Schuller. 
because he'd always have these like famous people. My dad loved actors and actresses and, and celebrities. And so on a Sunday morning, he'd go, look, look who he's got on. Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney saved. Great. And he pointed this up. And you'd look at the um, Crystal Cathedral, and it was beautiful. Just a beautiful building. It's finally purchased uh, from a group of people for, I think, $57 million. Schuler's kingdom fell, and another group of people bought it. $57 million. Ornate, beautiful, but I used to listen to the sermons that were shared there. And if you ever get a chance, you could YouTube this. Very rarely does Scripture show up. Very rarely does the Bible show up. It's all positive thinking. It's nice thoughts, but void of Scripture. Here's what God wants. I just want dirt. And dirt, by the way, is this. It's dirty. I know you're like, boy, I'm so smart. I come here and I learn stuff. Dirt is dirty. And he says to you and me when I come and I want to do worship, bring you with you. All that's you. All of my junk and my stuff. And and our desire a lot of times is to clean ourselves up before we come to God. I I want to clean myself. You and I can't. You know it. But we're so much like Israel. I got this. They said, you need to obey everything that is put before you. We're good. I don't know about you. It don't take me long to sin. Honestly, have you ever had that? You resolve in your heart that day. No, it's going to be different. Or in the middle of the night, you're going, I can't believe it. I'm still dealing with this stuff. And you go, tomorrow will be different. And tomorrow comes. And it does, and it takes, sometimes it's the stupidest thing that gets you back into that thing, whatever it is. Gossip. And you're, you get done with that phone call and you're like, I did it again. I did it again. You know what it is? It's that person. No, it's you. It's me. I like to do that. Isn't it? Seriously, track your sin life. You're like, really? Yes. Track, think about this, because some of you may, may, may not, I don't want to do this. Think, when I get into this situation, what brought me there? And you will find it's some of the dumbest stuff. Honestly, thought life. Something, you could be Captain Holiness. I mean, amazing. And a certain person will walk by, a certain commercial will come on, and you're like, it's like within minutes. Man, I am, I like to sin. It don't take much. And it's so Israel to, and of us, I got this. Here's, here's the beauty of it. We're dirty. So just start off, I'm dirty. I know I'm dirty. I don't want to keep being dirty, but I am. And here's the thing. That altar is a representative of that. It's a reminder, that's me. And I need a sacrifice because I can't do this. So he just starts off, make it of earth. I'm telling you, here's the beauty of it. Then any of us can come to him. It's not, okay, I, how many things do I need to do before I clean myself up? You, wait, wait a second, let me get this straight, God. You want me like this? Yep, I want you like this. It's really freeing. Man, my language, God, I, I, I just the way I talk and how I think. Some of the stuff I like. You, yep, I want you like that. Really? Yep. Let me take care of changing you. So the first one is dirt. Second part. Look at the second part of verse 24. Altar of earth you should make. And sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. Peace with God required a sacrifice. We are not at peace with God on our own. To be at peace with God, we will have to rely upon a sacrifice. And even Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. It took a sacrifice. It took a sacrifice. If you and I can be good on our own, the cross is not needed. I know that's, of course, but, and we, we look to it, but I don't know about you, I try on my own to have peace with God. If I just behave, if I, I did all this bad stuff yesterday, God, but if today I'm better, are we good? <laughs> peace with God comes through the sacrifice. I'm justified by faith. I'm putting my faith and trust on the finished work of God, and he's the bridge to God. And so I take that altar, and I make it of dirt, and and on it I'm putting that sacrifice, and it's already been done for you and me. We don't have to every year go and grab a lamb or a goat or a turtle dove or a grain offering or whatever. It's been finished by the work of Christ. Last part of verse 24. Your sheep and your oxen, and every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. See, God causes certain places to be places where he would have an altar and would actually come and bless the people there. God will come to those designated places. And they could build an altar anywhere, but that didn't mean that God's going to show up. So God had some designated areas. You and I are blessed because of the finished work of the cross. I can cry out to him at any time. Tomorrow, in the middle of an acknowledgement of, man, cry out to him. There's an altar right there. Bring it to him right there. Don't wait. Don't go, I'm going to finish this sinning. You ever have that where there's a certain show you're watching and it's really bad? But I'm going to finish this. Because I started, it's horrible. It's horrible. Turn it off. The same with sin. Oh, if I'm going to, I might as well, then I'll just confess it all at the end. You think about that thinking. I'm going to drink a little bit of poison. I'll drink all the poison. Stop. Stop. Bring it to him immediately. An altar is set up right there. Look at verse 25. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones or cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. God would not accept an altar made by or engraved by the hands of men. In fact, it is not acceptable to bring our works to approach him. As men, we want to bring him the niceness of our lives. So it wasn't just dirt, but it was, I want you to go around and I want you to pick up stones from all around. Uh, but, oh, but I could make something so much more beautiful, God. Just give me the chance. I'll just, cu- I'll just cut it out and I'll make it and it'll fit really nicely and I'll work it out. No, that's not the kind of worship. I want you to have a reminder. I want you to remember it isn't you. See, God demands it that way. There is nothing pretty about the cross. We've got this beautiful cross up here that is just so nice. But the real cross was gross, bloody, splinters, pain, nails that had gone into it over and over and over again, ugly. That's what saved us. That's what it cost. And everything in us wants us to, we want want an altar made from what we made. This is what I'm, I'm bring. Look what I'm bringing to you. And he's saying dirt and rocks. And it's by grace. You're, you're just finding rocks because, oh, there's some rocks. And I just put and I put this this thing of worship. together. But it isn't that pretty. Right. It's you and me. Ephesians two, eight and nine. For by grace. You have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. You didn't, you didn't carve those rocks out. You, you didn't have this nice mortar that would match the tones of the area behind it. 
This is dirt, and it's, and it's rocks that you've found. It's the grace of God that, that there's earth around here, and, and you're just putting something together. It's not of you. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. And here's why. So that no one may boast. They go, look at my altar. Look at the altar I made. Isn't it amazing? It's, this is where I come to worship God. Look at it. Look what he did. Look what he took. He cleaned it up. He did the work. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. I bring nothing to this party. It's so humbling. And so if you and I are, are, are thinking that way, I'll, I'll be good or I'll behave or I'll, I'll clean myself up or I'll do this, that is not acceptable to him. To obey is better than sacrifice. Just I'll do what he says. That's what you want me to do? Remember that story about Naaman? Remember Naaman? He was a, a Syrian general. And there was a Jewish girl who was, had contact with him. And the prophet knew how to get a hold of God. And so Naaman is told by the prophet... That um, And by the way, he has leprosy, in case you've never heard this story. He's got leprosy really bad. He's an amazing general, but he's got leprosy, and he, he doesn't want leprosy anymore. And so he's told by the prophet to go and dip seven times in the Jordan River. And that's the news he got. Seven times I want you to go and dip in the Jordan River. And he's mad. You know what? Remember why he's mad? The Syrian rivers were cleaner than the Jordan River. They were cleaner. He's going, what, what's the deal? I, I, I could just go there and, and it would be good. And he goes, the Jordan River, it's dirty. And he had the beauty of a counselor that said to him, if he had said to do something really difficult, would you have done it? Just, just do what he says. Just do it. You got nothing to lose. And he did it and he was cured. So much of this Christian life is just do it. Just confess. Just repent. Just own up. You're dirty. You and I are dirty. And after a while, let's face it, everybody knows. Really, everybody knows. You're like, oh, I can hide this. No, no, everybody knows. We think we're getting away with so much. Last, last point. God shapes. God shapes. The verse 26. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Wow, what's that? Well, there was to me no steps up to the altar. Uh, back then, they didn't have like fruit of the loom underwear, all right? Just so you guys know. Uh, that would eventually be the case. Uh, you see that. You don't have to, I mean, you can look up these later, but Exodus 28.42 and Leviticus 6.10 talks about that there were garments made by the priests. But at this point, no BBDs, all right? And they had come from a, um, place in Egypt that had these amazing altars that had steps that would go up really high and and uh, his way of making an altar God's way of making an altar was like waist high access to it so that the sacrifices could be brought and taken care of I don't want it to be this thing where you think you got some sort of stairway to heaven that somehow you're get, you're getting closer to God by your works by your climbing by your attaining there's no ladder to god there's a bridge to god through the person of jesus christ and and so i i this is not everything in pagan idolatry is lifting high and lifted up be exalted he is high and lifted up and this is just like a barbecue it's access that's easily done so that there could be sacrifice and 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 he wants us to know that no flesh is acceptable to god and we need an altar. 
and his name is Jesus. And this, this, this whole thing, if we're, if we're not careful, we go, well, that's for the people of Israel. We don't sacrifice anymore. Actually, we do. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this. I appeal to you, brothers. Remember, and we've said this, I don't know how many times, the first 11 chapters of Romans is theology of what God has done. Um, I did this, I did this. I, the wrath of God was being revealed. And then he talks about justification by faith. What I believe God and his credit to righteousness is put into my account and, and, and what that looks like. And then ultimately I, I have an understanding of the Holy Spirit and what he has done. And, and then I have the sin battle. And I see his sovereignty once again in um, chapters 9 through 11. And then I come to chapter 12. So he says, these are all the things that God has done. This is how all the things that he's prepared. Here's your part. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So he's in, in, in love. He's going, I just, I'm just trying to appeal to you. I'm trying to tell you what he's like to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So that's, that, that's what he's called. It's, it's that simple. He, he's saying, now you and I know, really, is it that simple? I know me. But this is, this is what I'm asking. I want you to present your body. You are not your own. This has so much bearing on what I do with my body. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And so I want you to think, and then I, most likely I'm going to ha- call on you to think differently. I want your mind to be renewed daily. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And that takes time. That takes, sometimes it takes effort. But anything worthwhile, if I was to spend any amount of time with you, I'd find out what you are passionate about and how much time you've invested in that thing. Reading about it, thinking about it. Uh, my son, as I was talking to you, he just, I'm telling you, he barbecues. He's got one of those eggs. Have you ever seen those eggs? He's got these contraptions that like overnight he'll start at like four in the morning and he's got like meat and it's got like Frankenstein things in it. So that like he knows the exact temperature and how long and you know, every now and then and I'll just go over and just open up and oh, act of worship. But it's time he's 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 initiated that he's he's made an effort. And and so when we look at the marinade here, um, the marinade is is something so important because when you have meat and, and you want to marinate it, you you put that it's vinegar sometimes and it's there's acids and there's oils and there's spices and it's all in there and and you put that and sometimes you put it all in there and then you throw it in the fridge in a baggie and then the next day you know you know it's gonna be awesome but what what's happened is there's a marinade going over that meat what are you and i marinating in all day and then we're shocked when the time comes of what comes out. Because another thing that was mentioned is heat. That's a key to, key to the barbecue. And, and when there's heat, that's what comes out of us. What's been put into us. And so what am I marinating in? What is the soup of the day that I swim in? And then why are we shocked when we respond a certain way or, or when somebody gets a whiff of us? That's, what, that's what's important to you? That's, that's what you value? That it's because that's what I've marinated in. There's a rub here. And I said, just add water or customize this with juice and soda and beer and bourbon. And just this, the picture is of, of rubbing. And there's going to be times where there's certain things that are just coming alongside you and rubbing into your life and, and what you and I draw n- near to, what we, what we come in contact with and what is massaging into our lives. It's, it's going to, when the heat comes, it's what's the juices that's inside there cooking. That's, that's, that's what's 
becoming a part of us. So when the hard times, when the fiery times come, what comes out is us. It's what we've put into the meat of our lives. And sometimes some of us, oh, I'm not going to think about that stuff. I'll just, I'll just have um, the barbecue sauce at the end, and I'll just put that over the meat of my life. I'll, I'll, I'll do that quick fix. I'll, I'll run to that thing. And, then I'll, and, and all of these things are good. And, and when a steak is done right, there's been times where I don't want any of that. I don't need it. It's, it's all good. But there's times where you go, I need that. And sometimes that may be where we're at when it comes. Church is the steak sauce of our life. We're, we're going through our day. It's like, oh, this is, this is what my, no, but I just put that on, you know, cover it up and act like everything's. And he's saying, I want it to be, I want you to marinate in me all week. I want to, I want you to allow me to rub into your life. So when the fiery times come, taste and see that the Lord is good, that the flavor of your life, that, that the Bible talks about a sweet savor when people would get to prayer and the fragrance that would go up to God in prayer. I want that. And so he made some, an altar waist high so that you and I would have access to it. It wouldn't be the thing, oh, I could never get up there. And if I did, the nakedness of my life, you'd see it. And I don't want you to know what I'm really like. Here's what you're like. You're dirty. You, no, you got nothing to bring to the party. And it's okay because Jesus took care of it. That's what I want. That's what I want for my life. And by the way, in a matter of minutes, I could get really proud. And I'm living on just steak sauce, barbecue sauce, as opposed to allowing him to take my life and make me a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is my reasonable act of worship. What a, what's your uh, altar looking like?